It's clear that our human condition is not trouble-free. We have a brain, but also a mind, which is the difference between having the means to do something and how we make use of that means. The brain has many circuits, or circles, but it also has the principle of being able to return to a state of rest after being stimulated, which is an energy problem. But the mind sees this also as an identity problem of how we wake up every morning as the same person, not someone different, despite our dreams, our changing emotions, and threats to our stability. The issue of the same is one of security, keeping uncertainties outside our protected domain, and anxiety of containing what we need to keep safe or hidden. Between the big things whose edges we will never be able to find and the little things that we can lock up, we suspect some kind of conspiracy, that there is something unreachable about what we can contain within reach and something locked up about what we need to lock out. The point is that we can be deceived about which is which. We can be tricked. The relation of the inside-outside problem to this vulnerability is what we call psychoanalysis. In psychoanalysis, a fundamental line is drawn between neurosis which keeps things more or less in place and doesn't get the scales of what's inside and outside confused, and psychosis, which automatically expects the opposite, is a kind of conspiracy between small things and infinite things. Neurosis is about maintenance, keeping things the same. But when this project gives way under strain or falls prey to a trick, Psychotic logic can mess around with all the neat boundaries set up by neurosis. In small doses, the neurotic is fascinated with boundary manipulations. Gadgets we can carry around connect us to global positioning systems managed by satellites. We can do our banking, check the news, and speak Chinese with something in our pocket. These little tricks are cute when we control them, but we suspect that they also control us without our knowing. And sometimes we are in fact open to manipulation by intentional scams where the promise of utility masks a plot, where instead of using, we are being used. From the gadget to the con game, there is a single logic that the psychoanalyst Jacques Lacan described in terms of connectivity. This podcast aims to expand the key term he used to describe this connectivity, the alethosphere, which is a combination of the Greek word for truth, aletheia, and what Lacan called an a-sphere, meaning a cover, but a cover that connects the infinite to what is local and very, very small. Cons or confidence tricks come in two sizes or durations. The short con is a simple trick, like picking a pocket or dealing from the bottom of the deck of cards. In the long con, the con artist counts on being caught by the victim or mark. The mark is then persuaded to join in the con, to be a part of the game, the scam. Even with gadgets and appliances, our complicity is encouraged. For example, in the case of brand loyalty, we are on the side of the manufacturer, not the user. Or we are expected to assemble our own furniture or learn to follow complicated instructions just to drive a car or fill a fountain pen. It's our fault if something goes wrong. The short con is what Lacan called a lathouse, the quick trick, the sleight of hand, the conventional concession. The long con, in contrast, engages our theory of the world, brings into question our identity 
our security, our need to keep things the same. Where threats are a matter of exclusion or containment, depending on the scale, the alethosphere, an A-sphere, breaks the rules of scale, connecting the large with the small. The con is the way the A-sphere is a stacked deck that always has us lose. We, the mark or victim of the con, believe in chance, but the con makes sure there is only necessity, as long as the mark believes in chance. The con is, in fact, the connection of chance and necessity, put in terms of a topology where something finite lacks boundaries, where a surface can be a trap without any doors being locked. This need to connect chance with necessity gives rise to the essential feature of the long con, the feature named the shill. The shill appears to be accidental, neutral, unbiased, but of course the shill is an agent of the con set up to fool the mark, thanks to her fake indifference. I have to assume that you know something about the story of Alfred Hitchcock's film Vertigo where a detective is hired to follow a rich woman around San Francisco, thinking that she is possessed by the spirit of her dead great-grandmother. But of course the wife is really being played by an actress who is setting up the detective to be the perfect witness at the inquest of the death of the actual wife, who is made to appear to have committed suicide because of her mad obsession. The psychosis of the shill takes advantage of the attentive neurosis of the detective. And here we have a model of how, in general, psychosis is like a stalker. Neurosis is like a victim or mark. Even the shill's technique of rotation turns out to be a part of the topology by which neurosis is exploited by psychosis. From the inside out, and the outside in, creating a surface, an alethosphere, or a-sphere, where inside and outside are indistinguishable. We call these kinds of trap surfaces projective. They appear to be three-dimensional, but are in fact two. And the two of the two is the ability to spin from three to two. This beautiful animation by Jos Lees shows how topology facilitates the critical role of the shill in that it can turn a shape that is able to contain something by holding it inside into a shape that can trap something by eliminating entirely the boundary between inside and outside. Lacan's point in calling attention to the alethosphere idea is to show that topology is the shape of what is real, not just what is appearance or belief. Because projective surfaces are transformational, they are about conversion of what we think is the case to what is really the case, from what we see as accidental and contingent to what is a matter of necessity. The human subject, like all living beings, is subject to contingency. But as a being that speaks, the human subject not only suspects that there is something fixed and necessary about this contingency, but is lured into it even when, or maybe we should say only when, anxiety seems also to be a source of pleasure. This is what gives psychoanalysis its necessary connection to mathematics and what gives figures such as the cross cap and interior eight, where space is turned inside out, the ability to show us what our subjectivity looks like when neurosis gives way to psychosis. Projective surfaces like the Mobius band on the left and the cross cap on the right are called projective because their necessity takes place in a virtual sense. We cannot make a perspective drawing or graph of what happens with a projective surface. 
we can only use animation to act out a tension between existence and non-existence, visibility and invisibility, barriers and non-barriers. We can pinch the two edges of a Mobius band with our fingers, but when we slide the band between them, we realize that our fingers have been tricked. There is only one edge, even though we have been keeping two edges separate all the time. With the cross cap, there is another pinch that closes off the sphere at the top. The sphere can obviously be inflated. The pinch shouldn't make any difference. But if we see that the surfaces at the top crisscross, we see that the sphere has become a kind of Mobius band, where an ant crawling along its single surface would go from what appears to be an inside to an outside and back again. The sphere, without being cut, can no longer contain an interior space or keep out an external space. Its Mobius band aspect has made it what geometers call non-orientable and self-intersecting. What we think would work to keep things contained or excluded no longer works. We can no longer trust it. It is the work of the con, the psychotic, in a game to victimize a mark by using a shill that twists between being and nothingness, or in more personal terms, love and death. Topology has the advantage of being able to show things that are almost impossible to talk about. The torus appears to be a straightforward kind of shape. It's a donut, and there could be nothing more friendly than a donut. But the surface of the donut allows us to draw a curious figure, an interior eight, which intersects itself, creating a twist that means that a con artist can dupe a victim. A gadget can connect to the alethosphere. A map on a small screen can connect to a GPS satellite and track us at the same time. The inflection point is where the line jumps the tracks, where the neurosis of the surface becomes the psychosis of the twist. The track is the furrow, where we think we are safe by following the regulating lines that map the surface at every point. But delirium literally means jumping or getting pushed out of the track, the regulating line, and becoming deregulated, that is, unruly. Topology might seem logically cold and orderly, but projective topology is delirious, off track. Its unruliness seems very personal. It is mathematically necessary, but somehow inexplicable. We have to invent a virtuality to think or talk about it. It is like an anamorphic image hidden inside an ordinary one, something we can see only from a special angle or point of view. Projective topology behaves the same way neurotics behave when they're having a bad day. The inflection point is the breaking point, where the rules we normally follow no longer seem to apply. We say our neurotic space is Euclidean because we can draw lines around and between things. We can make pictures and perspectives. We can turn towards things and turn away. In projective geometry, however, we can represent the virtuality that explains how, as speaking subjects, we are vulnerable to a breakdown of the rules of order, those symbolic relationships we have with others, our friends and families, our groups, our cultures. Our symbolic relationships are like contracts or machines that automate our interactions, tell us where to go and what to do. When we run across gaps or defects in this machine, we touch the real. We engage the virtuality which was there all the time as a kind of anamorphic presence and experienced the projective topology of a necessity we can't contain or draw or diagram. 
The inflection point is what Lacan called touke, borrowing from Aristotle a word that means something like at hand and thus touchable, but something whose tangibility seems impossible. Like our fingers pinching the two edges of the Mobius band, we can't believe it when we find out that there is only one edge. In our Euclidean imagination, we can only represent this as a hole, a void, a place to fall through, not just the surface, but through reality itself. The psychoanalyst Derek Hook has explained why Lacan used the symbol that looks like, to Americans, the dollar sign, but is actually an S with a bar through it. Hook tells us that we have to draw the bar first. Then we write the S as a curve that rotates around the bar, like the famous emblem known as Festina Lente, or Make Haste Slowly. In other words, opposites are combined. The bar is what anchors us to reality, to the symbolic. But although we are happy to have something to keep us in the same place, to hold us steady, we are aware that this anchor is also a restraint, a kind of prison house, and also a split between our two natures. It keeps us in place with invisible bars, with its own logic that is a kind of con or scam set up by the symbolic, the fine print in our social contract. What we accepted as the Euclidean or disc-like aspect is actually the site for the creation of a void, a point where reality, vanishing through a hole, becomes a touque, an opportunity to touch the real. At the point where we vanish into the void, the real, the twist or trick converts what we thought was our allegiance to the anchor, to what we call it impotency or resistance to change, into the very means by which we are trapped by reality and exposed to the real. Neurosis has become the good cop who sets us up for the bad cop, the psychotic. Neurosis has played the role of the shill in the con game. Our flip from apparent security to imminent threat of the real shows how the inflection point of the torus and other projective 2D shapes is also the place where the figure and ground reverse. In our Euclidean picture of reality, the figure is something in front of the ground something that can move, something that attracts our interest, which seems to have autonomy, a shape, an identity. The ground is associated with atemporal stasis, so that any change in locations and positions are immediately associated with a cause, a motive, or a threat. Identity is thrown into question in a literal way, because the response to any threat shown on the radar of the static ground, is to move or risk destruction. These contrasting functions of figure and ground are so fundamental to the evolution of the senses out of constant interaction across the boundary we set up between our identity and the anxiety used to define what is external to that identity, that the logic of the torus, with its built-in either-or relation of projective topology and perspectival framing are smoothly integrated into the subject's evolving nature. We have to accept that our subjectivity is topological, and once we do this, it's clear that the figure-ground relationships are not what they appear to be when we attempt to draw or map them in our neurotic Euclidean attempts to stabilize our reality. The way the figure can be called into question and the ground resists being questioned does not divide things neatly into categories. Being open to interrogation or resisting it has many shades of gray. In fact, 
You can't have one without the other. Attraction or resistance are not really two different things, but a motion that can move in one direction and find itself moving in reverse without having shifted gears. This means that figure has a ground inscribed within it, and ground, whose main objective seems to be to stay the same, has an internal essence of change. The object has a subject, and the subject is, at its heart, objective and alien. We can draw a line from this cross inscription to the condition of the scam because although we can't explain how opposites interact, we can make gadgets and set up tricks where we can see our wishes being fulfilled. In Hitchcock's Vertigo, the trick is that the detective falls in love with a fictional woman played by an actress working for the con. When he finds the actress, he tries to remake her into the very woman who tricked him. But of course that woman was not a part of the scam, but a victim herself. But this whole role was a part of the scam. So the circular logic is like the ancient toy, the thalmatrope, a circular token spun on a thread to combine the images on either side. In The Truman Show, a child is raised from birth to manhood inside a technological bubble, a movie set where his every moment is made into a TV show without him being aware that his family and neighbors are all actors, that he is the only dupe. He sees the container, but not the exit to the real world, the audience watching him where he is the unconscious star, or rather the star of the unconscious. These two films give us a rare insight into the topology of the alethosphere and its connection to the gadget or scam because they use literal containers that fail, literal buffers that give way, literal toys that spin. These make us realize that our cultures are filled with such devices that, in our everyday experience as neurotics, connect to psychosis by means of topology. We even have films such as The Matrix, where the two topologies, the Euclidean and the projective, are presented as literal choices. Take the blue pill and stay within the protective envelope of neurosis, believing in the symbolic and its Euclidean fantasies. Or take the red pill and get out of the track into the delirium of psychosis, the real, where boundaries and insulators fail to function. Are we always forced to take the blue pill or the red pill? Or like the Slovenian philosopher Slavoj Žižek, can we ask for a third pill? The third pill is our ability to think in terms of projective geometry as difficult as this sometimes seems to be. This means coming to terms with things that we normally think of as being straightforward, such as our demands for love and protection, for things to stay the same, for keeping things contained and excluding threats from the outside. Once we realize that our demand is a machine that generates a never-ending desire, a desire that makes us thirsty every time we take a drink, we see the other inconsistencies in the symbolic. For instance, we see that every sentence begins with something that won't be known until the end of the sentence. And although the time of language always moves forward, there is a simultaneous reverse movement. The vanishing point of meaning at the end is constructing at the very same time a point at the opposite end of time, making all narrative time a case of a projective line, and all meaning simultaneously projective and retroactive. This impossible conjunction of forward and backward, analysis and synthesis, makes every demand contain its own internal mirror condition. Every repetition we can describe in a diagram automates a desire that can't be drawn. The Cretan liar paradox where the Cretan tells us that all Cretans are liars, 
is universal for all language because it's the necessity for language to operate on two levels at the same time. We have to act to make a speech in order to create something that contradicts this act, a container filled with meanings. The necessity of each for the other is a necessity of impossibility, and this creates a forced choice condition, where if something is true, then it's false, and if it's false, then it's true. Continence leads to incontinence and vice versa. The perfect container is the one with open doors. We don't typically think of Lacan's famous graph of desire in terms of incontinence, but essentially this graph is a blueprint for making sure that the flushed toilet stays flushed. It's the diagram for neurosis, for the kinds of subjects who have an unconscious because they have to suppress some things in order to see others. This drawing of neurosis is fundamentally a blueprint for a boundary maintenance project. Lacan specified a special fastener technology called quilting points, where something comes up from below and tacks back down to hold things that could slide in place to keep them from slipping around. The retroaction of the quilting point attempts to deal with the threat of incontinence, what the neurotic fears most, an instability of the separation between here and there, up and down, inside and outside. Otherwise, how could things stay the same? The neurotic loves the same. The same is the same as love. And, as we know that love is never the same, the unary trait haunts the signifying chain at the point of conclusion, the punctuation that comes at the end of a sentence. This creates a retroactive circularity in that it recalls the suppressed first signifier, which was not first until the second alerted us to the ongoing counting process. The graph of desire is just for neurotics. Psychotics denied the paternal signifier are already suffering from incontinence, which we can see in their use of language. The layering of the graph seems to impose a hierarchy, but just the opposite is true. It creates a fractal logic that makes each part into a whole, a logic of synecdoche where scale doesn't matter. Inner circuits and outer circuits are like the subject's own intimate externality, or extimacy. One of the differences between neurosis and psychosis is the way that extimacy is covered by language by the neurotic, or left exposed and elaborated by the psychotic. This is the key to Jung's psychosis, where he continually plays up the key significance of opposites, and the need to reunite them. The neurotic can't let this happen, of course, since neurosis depends on suppression, and suppression is the basis of the unconscious, which the psychotic is lacking. The graph of desire is not about how the machine of neurosis works. It's about how it can fall apart. It shows the tunnels in hidden passageways, the leaks and the spills. The very barrier the neurotic constructs is simultaneously a cut that creates a remainder. Suppression is the main boundary that, as a cut, turns out to leak. We allow this leak in language when what remains behind, the meaning of the beginning of the sentence, is known only when the end is reached. The trauma we had in childhood was not a trauma at the time. We only realize it in a symptom we have later in life. Our symptoms are remainders from the past that we don't remember, that we think are just annoying quirks or ticks, the things that make us repeat ourselves. When we take our everyday neurosis into the analyst examining room, 
She reveals to us how our forgetfulness has created a shape and how the shape has turned a barrier into a cut that appears and disappears, depending on whether we try to cut through it or understand it as an abstraction. If we try the scissors approach, our materiality will create the barrier effect over and over again. If we force ourselves to theorize, if we relax our rules of associative order and let things combine on their own, then we forget about our projections and relax the quilting points. We begin to adjust our eyes to the darkness of touch, the connectivity of the 2D surfaces that pay no attention to binary oppositions or perspectival order. In short, we are in the realm of virtuality where we must acknowledge that the human subject is fundamentally an anamorphic being. If psychoanalysis is anything, it is a scissors job where the analysand is given a pair of shears and encouraged to cut open the surface that their neurotic sensibility cannot grasp. Tracing the line across the surface of the cross cap or drawing a line across the single side of a Mobius band is an exercise in anamorphic association where abstraction forces the neurotic to encounter each and every psychotic condition in particular excruciating detail. These are choices we never realize we had made, now opened up, traumas we don't remember suffering, habits of use made unfamiliar. The point is the necessary surrender to the virtuality of what is most concrete, a concession not that our fears have been imaginary, but the opposite, that we have made ourselves out of excluding the imaginary as such, by treating the virtual as an accidental choice and not the necessity of projective 2D surfaces. By reversing Jos Ley's animation, we see that cutting apart is a theoretical necessity, not because it shows what the inside of the cross cap looks like, but because it shows how it was made Theory is a demonstration, an undoing of the monster, de monstrum. In Latin, demonstrari means to make think, with an emphasis on forcing us to confront the details that resist being made into a picture. It may seem contradictory to be making a podcast to say this, but in a sense, the theoretical podcast differs from the pictorial one the pretty one, in that it presents things that are hard to look at. Jos Lays makes it possible to see projective shapes, but to do this he has to animate them, put them into a dynamic temporality. This is the same as saying that there is no separate space and time, that space is temporal and time is spatial. When you see the cross cap cut apart this way, analysis becomes synthesis, but not because you want it, you're forced to see it. This means that the Euclidean disk that describes the bottom of the cross cap is theoretically reducible to a vanishing point, and that the pinch or crease of the upper part, in theoretical terms, simply does not exist. The line vanishes, the vanishing point is created. The two events can't be coincidences. They must be connected. And the connection goes back to the definition of projective geometry, namely that every line is really a line and a point that lies at infinity. The bottom of the cross cap has the virtuality of a vanishing point lying on the horizon at the edge of the universe. All lines that are parallel disappear to the same point, so the crease is one member of a family of these lines, the lines that trace across the upper half of this projective geometry figure. 
We need to take a short break to say something about projective geometry. The history of projective geometry itself involves retroaction and therefore is a matter of psychoanalysis. Pappus of Alexandria discovered it in 300 AD, but he discovered that projective geometry was logically prior to Euclidean geometry, which historically came before it. So what was projective geometry before it was projective geometry? I would say that it was a geometry embedded in the uncanny practices of archaic cultures, feared as superstitions once culture became more sophisticated and thus suppressed by the comforting theorems of Euclidean geometry, which support the neurotic view of reality. In Euclid, there is a usual plane with lines that seem to vanish at points on the horizon if we draw perspective, but our geometric rules of order forbid them to intersect. Projective geometry accepts the experience of our senses, however, and shows another plane surrounding the usual Euclidean plane with vanishing points on a material infinity. This horizon is circular, so every vanishing point seen in one direction has another twin located opposite. Just as any two parallel lines will meet at a point, any one point is really two points, a negative and positive infinity. And in between these two voids, a line is formed. What is the projective plane? This is a kind of map we can make using simple algebra. If a point is central, then lines that represent line families all pass through it. There are many vanishing points, but really only one origin point, with lines called one-dimensional subsets of vectors bundled together that intersect a plane that can map their position as a set of Cartesian coordinates. If the plane is set at the z-level of 1, things are simplified. You only need two coordinates to describe the system of subsets. The plane is non-oriented, as the arrows on its edge show. The arrows are basically instructions of how you would fold the fundamental polygon, as this rectangle is called. You can see from their orientation that this kind of origami would be impossible, but sometimes this impossibility can be accomplished. We can make physical models, for instance, of the torus, the Klein bottle, and the Mobius band, because one set of arrows run parallel, or, as in the case of the Mobius band, are really just the expansion of a cut. Projective geometry is the basis of theory for psychoanalysis. It shows the necessity of theory, and at the same time is a theory of necessity. It forces a materialization to recognize the reality of virtuality and the status of the subject, the material subject, as an anamorphic being. My conjecture is a part of this theory of necessity and necessity of theory. If I have to do it, if anything, it's because it hasn't been done before, at least not in this way. My conjecture is fairly simple. It says that, because you can hold the strip of the Mobius band between your fingers, you literally feel two edges that are parallel lines. Then, as your fingers travel along the material edges, you realize that the two lines are really one line. This means that the vanishing point required by the parallel lines is decentralized. It is a generic property of the whole lower half of the cross cap meaning that the function of continence we thought was the main property of this half is really a maximal state of incontinence, which is to say it's a passageway, but a passageway that opens up only to the theoretical consciousness. What I'm saying is that theory and reality are not separate. They are not like something and a description or explanation of or idea about something. They are simultaneous. They require each other. They necessitate each other. 
In projective geometry, there are not single lines, but families of lines, lines that are parallel, lines associated with vanishing points. This is why Lacan is so interested in Girard Desargues and Blaise Pascal, the mathematician philosophers who rediscovered Pappus's theorems in the 16th century. They opened the way for 19th century mathematicians such as Gauss, Riemann, and Mobius to expand projective geometry through a variety of self-intersecting and non-oriented forms such as the Klein bottle and Boyce surface. My conjecture focuses on the cross cap as a conjunction of two different natures, the projective and the seemingly Euclidean, because I want to show how there is an anamorphic relationship between continents, the lower half, and incontinents, the upper half, that helps us frame another key issue, that of idempotency. Idempotency is the power of the same, the force that holds the neurotic subject in place and buffers it from psychosis. This buffer gives way, however. It gives way when the neurotic has had a bad day, but it is also the essence of the work of art that models this breakdown in its key forms, such as tragedy and comedy. These are polite forms of the ancient practice of sacrifice, seen from two perspectives, one being the victim, the other being the collective that insists on symbolic annihilation of one it values the most. All cultures have in their early stages practiced literal sacrifice. All cultures in modern times are obsessed with symbolically repeating the logic of sacrifice. My speculation points to art and architecture as staging grounds for this continuation. Lacan was just as ambitious. Although he didn't name sacrifice as such, it is the structure of discourse where the bar of his four mathemes work as an instrument of suppression and containment, and where dynamic forces work against containment. We can see continents and incontinence as the driving forces in Lacan's theory of discourses, just as we can see circuits and circulation moving a chain of elements as figures across a fixed ground. Like my conjecture, there is yet no theoretical work on these connections, but because Lacan literally connected his theory of discourse with his theory about the alethosphere, my connection of figure ground issues, continents and incontinence, the topology of projective surfaces, and the issue of the anamorphic subject is justified. I'm saying what Lacan said, that the theoretical and the actual are two sides of the same coin. They're in fact a thaumatrope. This is a hysterical claim and a claim that the theory itself is hysterical because it necessitates seeing things in thaumatropic oppositions as separate but combined, appearing but disappearing. Travel where? Lacan is not an antiquarian, but he does travel into the past to find tales that tell his story, all the better because they are not invented by would-be psychoanalysts out to trick us. In the story of Daphne and Apollo, the backstory is critical. Apollo has insulted Eros about his bad archery skills, and to get revenge, Eros has shot Apollo with an arrow of love, but the nymph Daphne gets an arrow of hate. Some say it's the same arrow, with two points, which would make it a one-dimensional subspace, a line with two points, or a circle with one point located at infinity, both idempotent and a passageway. Lacan says this story gives us a picture of architecture as a surface of pain. What does he mean? First of all, we see Apollo's pursuit as the torus of demand traveling in a projective line that keeps it from reaching his goal. Second, 
we see Daphne's flight as creating its own trap. As soon as she wants to escape, she invents a space that prevents escape. Daphne is hysterical, like all good water nymphs. So when she begs her father for a way out, he does the opposite. He makes her into a permanent feature of the landscape, a very essence of idempotency, a fixed tree. Apollo can't use a tree the same way he was planning to use Daphne, but at the same time, she's not going anywhere, so he has her without having her, and vice versa. Like the Greeks who invented this story, we could say many symbolic things about Daphne. We could make her laurel leaves into garlands for winners of Olympic contests. Or we could say that a tree is a world axis and point it to the fixed stars. We could make it into a projective line, a family of lines, a forest where you get lost in a Mobius band kind of way, circling around to where you started every time you tried to find a way out. But for now, I have a different plan. It's to see how the most famous anamorphic painting we have, Holbein's double portrait of the ambassadors, also uses a one-dimensional subspace to identify a vanishing point, a point that is two points, the antipodal skull, said to be the skull of Adam, with the tree that is the crucifixion of Christ. As a viewing point, the skull is monocular because it is forbidden the parallax represented in the main image of the painting. It is a narrow tube of invisibility connecting the bone of the skull, the idempotent state of the corpse, to the symbol of immortality, another form of idempotency. Idempotency of the former is about continence, the continence of the grave. Idempotency of the latter is about resurrection and therefore incontinence of eternal life. With all these variations on figures, grounds, and figure ground reversals, we open up multiple categories of ethnographical connections. I want to keep things as simple as possible and focus on why Lacan uses this idea of a surface of pain to define architecture. There is really very little discussion of this, although Seminar 7 on Ethics has other key references to architecture, to the void and to the Baroque. My conjecture expands the idea of the void as the place where projective geometry joins Euclidean geometry, where one vanishes into the other. The vanishing point lies at infinity from one point of view and is thus the hallmark of incontinence, the place where space seems to lack any outer boundary. But from another point of view, the point must be at the center, where bundles of lines or line families pass through to intersect the projective plane in a way that we can define them algebraically as coordinates with relative positions and recognizable configurations. It's the recognizability I'm interested in. It's how things, in art especially, where we allow all kinds of weird things to happen that are impossible or impractical in real life, to be played out as a form of entertainment. We would think that there is no necessity in art, that it's all about contingencies and coincidences. But in fact, the opposite is true. There is a necessity that emerges out of art's presentation of improbable circumstances. One sign of this is that, no matter how outlandish we may find a premise of a work of art, we almost always find it recognizable. We suspend our disbelief and accept the axioms as if we had made them ourselves. In The Truman Show, for example, the proposition that a child is raised from infancy inside a technological bubble that allows him to be the unsuspecting subject of a television comedy running decades seems at first weird, but we immediately accept it as possible. In fact, it's something we have suspected for ourselves, that we are being watched, being manipulated, allowed to think that we are free, while in fact we are in a kind of barred prison. This is the classical paranoia, and when we face it theoretically, 
we face it as hysterics who call the manipulator Christoph, in the case of the Truman Show, to answer for his crimes. Our hysteria is justified by our relation to our lost joy, our jouissance, which always seems to vanish just as we have it within our reach. So it's on the basis of recognizability that I push forward another one of Lacan's difficult ideas, that of automata and 2K, because in The Truman Show, these are present directly in the form of the scam that imprisons Truman without his knowledge, making him the perfect mark of a scam. And when he finds a way to escape, he must give us a quite literal model of the 2K or encounter with the real. It's the vanishing point that is simultaneously on the edge and in the center. He sails into a fake sky, thinking that it's incontinence. But it's the container that has held him in place as an idempotent subject. However, it's equipped with a stair to an exit door, a door that is between his movie set and the television audience. Truman seems to find a choice at this point, and Christoph, the director, tries to talk him out of it. But once the spell is broken, Truman has no choice. His choice is to have no choice. He flips out of a world as a neurotic held in place by psychotics, now to become a psychotic in a world held in place by neurotics. He's in one of the inner swirls of Lacan's graph of desire. Turning the situation around doesn't really change things. He's discovered that the forced choice is embedded into the real. It's a thaumatrope that is, like the ancient thaumatrope, both a toy and a prayer, an automaton and a 2K.